your response is the same as Thomas Drake's, which is this, the Leahy Sensenbrenner bill. And I'm just wondering um, two things. What about Holt, Rush Holt, which I feel like is... Um, rocket I mean, scientist, man. Why doesn't anyone listen to the rocket scientist? Right. Yeah, it, <laughs> seems, it seems more comprehensive. That's what I like about it. It is, yeah. It yeah. is. But there's no way on God's earth it will pass. Fair enough. I mean, that's, that, that's the thing, is that like, Leahy Sensenbrenner has a shot of passing. Um, but Holt, uh, Holt doesn't, not as we currently exist, not unless we get, and, and let me go back to this scary revelations thing is that, um, I think very few people realize partly because this dragnet is at least on paper targeted preferentially at Muslims and Arabs and South Asians. Um, and therefore when people compare things that happened with these Muslims and Arabs and South Asians with things that happened to Martin Luther King or to anti-war protesters in the 70s, and, and it's usually white liberals who are making these comments, um, they, they seem to <coughs> not understand that if entire faith communities are being heavily surveilled in the same way that the black churches were in the 70s, right? Because they were, they were a seat of, of dissension um, and it, one that was viewed as a dangerous seat of dissension. Um, people don't see any, any parallels there. In other words, you know, and there have been a number of mosques, mosques themselves, both in the NYPD program, but also in, you know, in, in the FBI zone targeting, that have been targeted as terrorist hotbeds. And they're not terrorist hotbeds as much as they're um, aggressive critics of American policy. And yet, when you start naming imams from those mosques, and I, and I guarantee you that some of these mosques, these imams are on the dragnet list. Not necessarily, and this is why it's important, the First Amendment distinction for these domestic collection programs in the 12333, because the First Amendment review should protect them if they're on there because they're Muslim, it should protect them. If they're on there because they have politically unpopular views, it should protect them. Um, you know, it should protect their freedom of association, right? Um, it should protect them if they're Democrats or Republicans. And, and, and yet I don't think that a great deal of First Amendment, I don't, I don't, and, and you see it, frankly, in the court documents that come out in terrorism trials that um, they say, well, you know, there's the First Amendment protection, but then there's the First Amendment stuff that isn't protected. Um, there's some legal basis for that, unfortunately, and there's some, you know, I think to some degree they're using the secret court filings to get away with claiming that First Amendment stuff is no longer protected in this country. But um, one thing I keep coming back to is one of the, one of the disclosures in 2009 that I seem to be the only one who's harping on let me go back. In, in August of 2009, the NSA did a training program, and um, it was kind of for their legal people. And at the beginning, they said, here are past abuses. And they named, among other things, Project Minaret, which, which is the watch list program that targeted M Martin Luther King and a bunch of anti-war activists in the 70s, 60s, and 70s, right? Mm -hmm. And they said, this was a terrible abuse. We agree this shouldn't happen. By the end of the training, they compared Project Minaret to what I believe is part of the phone dragnet. And they said, we were watch listing, they didn't, they didn't use the word watch listing, but the, you know, they, we were tracking um, Americans without authority. And I think this is what I've discovered, which is that there were 3,000 U.S. persons in 2009 who were dis discovered to be on what is a watch list. And their communications were being watch listed. Um, and the important part is, the NSA claimed to the FISA court that they had identified these 3,000 U.S. persons um, via 12-333 data. So in other words, they said, we didn't learn about it from domestic sources. We learned about it because GCHQ, GCHQ told us about it. So let's assume that that's true and that that's what happened. But they got 3,000 targets, 3,000 U.S. persons that they were going to track the communications of. Um, and importantly, they dumped them into the domestic system. So they were then tracking all their domestic communications as well. And they never did that First Amendment review. They did a review and said, we agree that all these 3,000 people, there's a reasonable articulable, articulable suspicion that they have some tie to terrorism. But they never did the second part, which is required for U.S. persons, which is 
uh, we've also we also verify a high level NSA person. We also verify that these people aren't on this watch list solely because they said something like Al Qaeda is right or America's evil or um, you know Allah. There's a lot of things you can ima- you can imagine that should be protected speech that also might get somebody on a terrorist watch list. Mm-hmm. And they didn't do that for these 3,000 people. Um, not only am I the only person who's reported that, but, um, but what happened was after the FISA court discovered this and, and the NSA kind of, the, the NSA did tell the FISA court, I think there are reasons why they told the FISA court at the time they did, but they told the FISA court. The FISA judge, Reggie Walton, says, you know, explain to me how Americans get targeted under 12333. Explain to me what kind of First Amendment review they get there. Crickets. They got no answer. So this was one of those examples where the NSA just wouldn't let FISA court have any visibility on what they're doing on 12333. And when he said, you've got to clean up this alert list and you've got to clean up all these people who are on the alert list and shouldn't be, including these 3,000 Americans who have been watch listed uh, without any First Amendment review, all NSA did was move them off the domestic list so they could no longer chain on the domestically collected phone records, but left them on the 12333 list. So they're, you know, as far as we know, they're still being watch listed. Mm-hmm. And so I think what happens is people um, in the United States don't think that the surveillance of Muslim communities is the same as, say, the surveillance of black churches in the, in the 60s and 70s was. And, and, and there, there's, you know, yes, I understand that there have been some Muslim terrorists, but what they are acceding to with that assumption is that um, because there have been some Muslim terrorists, you know, and we can leave aside whether or not black power counted as black terrorists or not, but, um, but, it, but it is an interesting parallel, but, um, but, but because there have been some Muslim terrorists with ties to foreign countries, therefore it is okay to treat Muslim faith communities in the ways that we consider completely out of bounds as J. Edgar Hoover having done in the 60s and 70s for, for black faith communities. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the logic that I think is underlying a lot of the comparison of what happened in the 70s and now. And, and very few people can get outside of that but you know very few people like and and i've tried to engage some people and say look you know the nsa themselves said that they're doing something akin to minaret why don't you believe them um but but um but i but i think it's also this mindset that says muslims aren't like the rest of us Mm -hmm. and so until through the cybersecurity stuff and cybersecurity is also going to mean ip policing so if you download a lot of you know hollywood movies that's going to get you targeted as well um, until kind of white people in the suburbs get targeted through cybersecurity surveillance, I think there's going to be this double standard that the same kind of watch listing that happened in the 60s and 70s doesn't count as watch listing here because scary Muslim terrorists. And, right. th- and that's really where we're at. Mm-hmm. Look, I think 9-11... Um, look, we have protected the Saudis, right? We have protected the Saudis. We have protected the CIA protection of Saudi agents in the United States ever since 9-11 happened. I don't think that means that 9-11 was an inside job. Um, I think it clearly was done with high-level Saudi awareness that we have chosen. I mean, and we had a choice after 9-11, which was to go after the Saudis or to go after, you, you know, Al Qaeda leave behinds in Afghanistan, and we we did we did the latter, um, and only now, kind of in the aftermath of the Syria debacle, did we start to move away from the Saudis. And and uh, Obama's about to you know he just scheduled a trip to go meet with King Abdullah now, um, and you know and I think that we still you know. The, the the national security people will admit to you that at, at least until two thousand nine. The Saudis refused to stop funding terrorism, and yet they were our top allies. I don't think we still have cleaned that up. I don't think we can look at, at a lot of terrorist activities and say with complete confidence that at least one faction of the Saudi family, and, and it is a very factionalized royal family, so I'm not saying 
you know, the people we work with on a day-to-day basis are backing terrorists. But I do think there are factions within the Saudi family who still do back terrorists. And so I think that, uh, that, um, that that's, that's different. I think it's clear the Saudis had an, some foreknowledge of what was going on. I think it's possible other people had foreknowledge because they were spying on the Saudis. Um, I think the CIA traditionally is too close to the Saudis. And I think John Brennan as CIA director is really dangerous for that reason precisely because he used to be the, the Riyadh station chief. Um, and I'm not the only one who said that. Like my, Mar, uh, Michael Scheuer has said that, that, that there, there were people who were fighting Al-Qaeda in the late 90s who felt that John Brennan was running interference for the Saudis as he was station chief. Um, so that's very different from saying that 9-11 was an inside job. But I also think that our relationship to terrorism as a country um, you, we are we weren't the Bush administration did not believe and and both Bush and Cheney had close ties to the Saudis, although it got really frosty with the Saudis for several years. They did not believe that we could go after the Saudis because um, we don't have because we were dependent on their oil. I think that's one of the reasons why, in spite of all the horrible things that fracking does to this country and that the trans the the KXL pipeline will do. I think that's why Obama continues to back this very dangerous domestic drilling, and it's to get some kind of independence from the Saudis so we can start to um, hold them accountable for the things the Saudis do. I think that um, there was a moment in the Syria build up to war where we realized we had lost control of the Saudis, and the Saudis had lost control of the terrorists that they had fighting Assad. Um, and and yet I think we're already losing our, you know, we're we're kind of sidling up to the Saudis again. So that's, a, that's, that's what I think, is that I think that um, we chose not to fight terrorism in the way that we should have because we don't, we rely on the Saudis to keep the oil exchange on the dollar. Without that, the dollar would become a lot less valuable and our power position in the world would become a lot less stable. Um, and we rely on their oil. We rely on them being able to be the swing producer um, to you know, to 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 ensure that the the Middle East as a whole, that the oil producers, and it's not just the Middle East; it's Nigeria, it's it's Venezuela, um, that oil producers as a whole can't bottleneck the the rest of the world. And so, I I think that's that explains why we responded to nine eleven the way we did. So, the rule of law. So, I think this might be the last question. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, this is the big. I the, what I think in America today is that there are, and I could be mistaken. There are three big issues: there's the Constitution, there's the economy, and then there's the environment. There are other obviously important subjects, but that's really where I see the bread and butter of average people's lives going two centuries into the future. That's what's right. gonna. That's what's gonna matter. The decisions we make now about those three issues. I agree. So, just talking about rule of law itself. You know, do you feel like this domestic surveillance, however you want to look at it, you know, I see it as more than metadata. Do mm-hmm. you think that there's a real deterioration in our democracy that's occurring as we speak? Yes. Um, but I also think that until civil libertarians, and I'm not all that good at this because I'm so stuck in the weeds most of the time that I'm not c- connecting these dots. But until we explain to people how the unconstitutional surveillance state and national security state feeds the other two problems, how, you know, a focus on fighting terrorism leads us not to focus on fighting um, climate change. And, and underlying that is the oil formula that I just described. Um, until we explain to people how keeping this kind of villain, villain, this uh, fear of terrorism, makes it a lot easier to, and and I'd say the war on drugs is part of this as well, makes it a lot easier to keep people poor, to prevent people from fighting back against, you know, the gross inequality that's really become to our country. Till we connect those dots, then I, you know, I don't, I think we're still losing the battle because, um, I agree that climate change is a more urgent threat to the United States right now than surveillance state. I agree that, you know, most Americans, 50% of Americans who've had their life, their, their, their quality of life decline in the last four years 
are going to say the economy is far more important than the surveillance state. Until we tie these together and tie that picture together, we're not going to make change in any of those areas. Okay. Which is why I think we should, you know, can insist on calling J.P. Morgan Chase a transnational crime organization. Right. So we got five minutes. So yeah, I mean, I, I did want to. There's a bunch of things I want to jump back to, but you, I want to jump back to that too because. It gets to the very. It gets to. So I made you laugh. Like you didn't expect that at all. <laughs> well, I didn't know. I didn't because I listened. Here's the other. Thing. I listened to Alex Jones. Do you know who Alex Jones is? I do. I don't listen to him, but I know who he is. Yeah. I, I check him out. You know. You know. I'll check him out. I like him. I like him a lot. I think he's a really important voice. To be frank, you know, I think his interpretation of issues is a little off. It's a little mm -hmm. bit heavy-handed. But um, but you know, the, a lot of people. In the 9/11 community, 9/11 Truth community, they talk about the bankers and the banking conspiracy, and I think there's a lot of truth to that, you know. And I don't think there, there, there's really the academic research to back up those arguments. Unfortunately, there's a, there really isn't, not that I know of. Um, yeah, what you can see is um, University of Missouri, Kansas City does a lot of work about um, the 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 institutionalized fraud that has become banking. Um, so there is that economic. That there's an economics crowd of people who are talking about how banking is basically organized fraud, right. which is different than what you're saying. But there is there is an interesting line of academic stuff. Right. So I guess the question I'm thinking is like you have this. You, we talk about J.P. Morgan. You say it's an international crime syndicate, and but people don't really, you know, the the mainstream doesn't see that at all. You know, and I'm just wondering if you. I mean, I, I kind of harp on the same question. It's like you have. You have reality, and then you have the the illusions, and most people are governed by these illusions. And I'm just that's all. And I don't. No, and I think I think it's particularly powerful with the banks, and part of the reason is because the banks are very close to big newspaper publishers. Um, you know, every you know the big media, at least the New York based media, they live side by side with the bankers. I think um, the the bankers are very you know this whole. Um, the people criticizing bankers are Nazis thing from last week. It's like, I think that, um, and who's buying Congress except for the bankers? And so the places where you set narrative are all places that the bankers have a tremendous amount of sway. And um, courts have been very... I mean, when you look at just the, the the foreclosure crisis is just one of the four or five main transnational crime schemes that J.P. Morgan Chase has been involved in the last several years. Um, but when you look at what's happened at 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 the at the household level with regards to rule of law, as people tried to save their houses when banks had no paperwork to prove ownership before they foreclosed, um, the banks just rolled them. And there's a lot of reasons they succeeded in rolling them. A lot of states made it almost impossible for people to protect their homes. Um, a, a lot of, you know, the banks were just, the, the, the judges were just loath to, to, because it was so unimaginable. Had the banks had to eat what they did with the foreclosure crisis, the big banks would have all gone under. But because they had the, you know, big, because of the finance involved, they would have all gone under. And the banks, the, the judges were so loath to, to be a party to that, um, with, you know, maybe five exceptions in the entire country, that they, that they put aside rule of law. And, and the same thing happens with national security considerations, as, especially the phone dragnet, which is clearly illegal. But the bankers, but the, but the judges just kept saying, you know, um, we have to approve it because that otherwise they won't come before the courts anymore and it's important and yada, yada, yada. The same thing happens with the banks, but it happens in a way that it involves individuals' lives in a much more direct way. And that's, you know, I, I talk a lot about rule of law for counterterrorism suspects, for the surveillance issues, for torture, for what have you, for some kind of accountability for a lot of the crimes that went on with the wars. But when you talk, if you, if you want to see you know, aside from communities of color who have always borne the brunt of things like the war on drugs, um, if you want to look at, at, at the real expansion, the, the, the real expansion of the decline of rule of law, you look at those bank crimes that have been um, committed against, you know, average Americans all over the country, and they, they've gotten away with it. Yeah. Just totally gotten away with it. Okay. Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you.